Let's pray. Oh, Father, we look forward to seeing you in heaven. Jesus, seeing you glorified. And Lord, I do pray as we live here that we would run this race, that we would run it well, finish it well. I pray for tonight as we look at your word, as we look at 2 Timothy, that Jesus, you would be glorified in it, that we would be heartened by what you have for us tonight. In Jesus, it's always in your great name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Tonight, we're continuing our 66-book study with the book of 2 Timothy. This is where we take a book of the Bible each Sunday for 66 Sundays, and we preach an entire sermon on the entire book. And tonight, that's 2 Timothy. So please open your Bibles to 2 Timothy. This book is the second book of what are called the pastoral epistles. The pastoral epistles being 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Last week, we went through 1 Timothy, and we covered a lot of background information on Paul and Timothy, on imprisonments and roles and dates. And I'm not going to repeat that here tonight. So if you didn't hear that message last week, I would highly recommend that you listen to it as it provides a lot of valuable background information for tonight. As we get started, I want you to think of a relay race. In the Olympics, there are primarily two track and field events that are called relays, the 4x100 meter and the 4x400 meter. This is where four runners from a qualified country compete together in a race that covers that given distance. What makes this event a relay race is something called a baton, a rod-like object. The first runner starts with the baton and they run their specified distance and they must pass this baton to the next runner. And this is repeated until the fourth runner has the baton and finishes the race. The passing of the baton from one runner to the next is known as the exchange. And this exchange can only occur in a very specific 20 meter changeover box. The exchange is a very technical part of the race and requires split second coordination and is fraught with peril. Ideally, the incoming runner is running at full speed, around 20 miles an hour, and hands off the baton to the next runner, who is, has accelerated up to full speed also, roughly 20 miles an hour. The passing of the baton is arguably the most critical part of the race. Failure to maintain speed through the exchange, and you lose. Failure to pass, failure to pass the baton, and you're disqualified. Failure to pass the baton within the changeover box, and you're disqualified. There are many times when the country with the four fastest athletes in the world have failed to win the gold medal because they have failed in the exchange. They have failed to pass on or receive the baton. And tonight, as we walk through 2 Timothy, we're going to see the passing of the baton of gospel ministry. But before we jump into the text, we need to understand the current situation. Shortly after the end of what's recorded in the book of Acts, Paul was released from prison around 60 to 62 AD, and he jumped right back into his ministry endeavors. And by the time we get to 1 Timothy, written approximately 63 AD, he had Timothy stay in Ephesus while he had gone into Macedonia. Things seemed pretty normal in the hard, challenging work of church planting gospel ministry. However, by the time we get to 2 Timothy, written approximately three years later in 66 AD, things had changed. Things had dramatically changed. In the course of those three years, a number of significant events had taken place. In 64 AD, the Roman Emperor Nero burned significant portions of Rome to the ground. And when rumors began circulating that he had had a hand in it, he quickly moved to blame Christians. Christians were already widely seen as contemptible and became an easy scapegoat. Thus started Nero's brutal persecution of Christians. One commentator describes it this way. While still alive, 
Some Christians were sewn into skins of freshly killed animals and released into the arena among wild dogs who tore them to pieces. Others were coated with pitch and set afire to light Nero's garden parties. In the midst of this persecution, Paul was arrested and re-imprisoned in Rome. Under Paul's first imprisonment, he was under house arrest and he was given a lot of freedom to preach and teach. And God's word tells us it was in all openness, unhindered. However, this time, he's been arrested and imprisoned as a criminal of the Roman Empire. He's in the process of being condemned. He's literally in chains and suffering within a dark, poorly sanitized cell as he awaits his final sentencing and execution. He knows that the time of his departure has come. In addition to that, all in Asia have turned away from him. Many of his closest companions have left him. And the churches, which are always on Paul's mind, continue to be attacked by false teachers. Under those circumstances, under those dire circumstances, Paul writes this letter. His very personal and intimate last letter to his beloved companion, Timothy who is in Ephesus. The purpose of Paul writing this letter is simply passing the baton. Passing the baton of gospel ministry. The Apostle Paul's earthly ministry is coming to a close. He's finished the race. And he encourages, exhorts, and admonishes Timothy to continue in the difficult hardships of gospel ministry. He wants Timothy to grab the baton and to run with it. So tonight, we're going to see that receiving the baton of gospel ministry requires four ongoing activities regarding the treasure that is the word of God, particularly the gospel. Receiving the baton of gospel ministry requires actively, number one, guarding the treasure. The first ongoing activity required to receive the baton of gospel ministry is guarding the treasure. Let's start reading 2 Timothy, starting in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice and I am sure that it is in you as well. Right away, this letter has a very different tone from 1 Timothy. In the salutation, Paul says to Timothy, my beloved son. Paul doesn't address anyone else like this. He doesn't address Titus or Philemon this way. He doesn't even address Timothy this way in 1 Timothy. There he says to Timothy, my true child in the faith. But here he says to Timothy, my beloved son. Paul is Timothy's spiritual father. And Timothy is his beloved spiritual son. As Paul is in prison, he prays for Timothy constantly and longs to see him. He also recalls his genuine and sincere faith, which Timothy's mother and grandmother also exhibited. This is a very personal, affectionate, and intimate beginning of this letter. Continuing in verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Paul exhorts Timothy to remember to literally keep the fire alive of God's gifting of him. God has gifted Timothy for this work, but Timothy's fire has cooled and he needs to fan the flames. God has not provided timidity, and this timidity is a state of fear, because of lack of moral strength or courage. 
from an earthly perspective, it's no shock that Timothy was fearful or lacking courage. And there would be many earthly reasons for this. He had frequent physical ailments. The Ephesian church has been under attack from false teachers. There's state-sponsored persecution of Christians across the Roman Empire. His spiritual father has been arrested and charged as a criminal, is in the process of being condemned. Other gospel workers were ashamed and they turned away. The situation seems pretty dire. But God has provided a spirit of power and love and discipline. Our courage does not come from that which exists in ourselves naturally, but stems from that which God provides. Paul continues in verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Paul tells Timothy not to feel shame or disgrace because of the testimony of the Lord or of him. It says here that Paul is his prisoner. Paul is first and foremost the Lord's prisoner, not necessarily Rome's, recognizing God's sovereignty over all of these circumstances. Anyone associated with Christ or Paul would have been criticized and suffered persecution, perhaps unto death. Not only don't be ashamed, but Timothy was commanded to join Paul in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. One called to gospel ministry in these circumstances was going to suffer great hardship. But Timothy was not being commanded to do this in his own strength, but according to the power of God, the God of the gospel, the God who saves. Paul then recounts what God has actually done in salvation. In verse 9, who, the God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus, our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. We all need reminders of gospel truths that saved us. To provide gospel-empowered motivation and courage. And Paul supremely trusted the security of his own soul to the sovereign one who can perfectly guard it until that day. Next, Paul provides two commands to Timothy. Verse 13, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Timothy is to retain, hold on to, hold fast to these sound words, the doctrine that he had heard from Paul. He spent roughly 15 years as Paul's companion. Paul being the Holy Spirit-inspired Old Testament scholar who wrote much of the New Testament, yes, listen to him, hold fast to his words. And next, in verse 14, Paul says, guard. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Timothy is commanded to guard. The word here for guard was a, a military term used of a soldier on a watch who was accountable with his own life to protect that which was entrusted to him. And what is Timothy to guard and to protect by the power of the Holy Spirit? Timothy was entrusted with the treasure of the gospel. He is to actively guard it and protect it. Satan, with all his demonic influences, wants to distort it, counterfeit it, twist it. He wants to make it about man and what he has achieved rather than what God has accomplished in the gospel. Timothy has 
been a fellow worker in the gospel ministry with Paul, and Paul is passing the baton of gospel ministry. And as Timothy receives this baton, Paul commands him to actively guard the treasure that is the gospel. Paul has told Timothy, God has gifted you for this work. God has provided you the resources for this work. God has provided the circumstances for this work. Therefore, as you do this work, actively guard and protect by the power of the Holy Spirit, the treasure, the gospel that has been entrusted to you. This chapter closes out with some refreshing encouragement. Verse 15 You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelius and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. Because Timothy is in Ephesus, which is in the region of Asia, he already knows of the abandonment and the rejection of these associates who were ashamed of Paul's chains. But in contrast to that, Paul was refreshed by Onesiphorus, who was not motivated by the potential dangers of guilt by association that would have been a real threat. And he found Paul, and he cared for him, and he refreshed him. Receiving the baton of gospel ministry requires, active, number one, actively guarding the treasure, and next, number two, passing on the treasure. Let's look at chapter two, starting in verse one. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. The gospel treasure must be passed on. Paul has given something immensely valuable to Timothy, and Timothy is to take this valuable treasure and entrust it. Entrust it to faithful, trustworthy men who will be able to teach others also. Timothy is to identify and pour into men that are faithful and trustworthy and able to teach. Timothy is to disciple the next generation of men that will, Lord willing, shepherd the various churches. We see four men or groups of men represented in these three exchanges. Paul to Timothy, Timothy to faithful men, faithful men to others. It's the relay race of gospel ministry. The passing of the baton to the next leg of the race. And this relay race has continued for nearly 2,000 years and will continue until the Lord returns. The gospel treasure must actively be passed on. Continuing in verse 3. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Paul jumps right into providing three word pictures of a soldier, of an athlete, and of a farmer to illustrate the hardship, commitment, determination, and diligence required for those that will faithfully lead in gospel ministry. Paul continues in verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. Paul commands Timothy to remember Jesus Christ, the living one who conquered death, and the reigning one, the promised king as motivation to keep his eyes on the prize and not on the circumstances of the world. He is to remember Jesus, the one who lives and the one who reigns. Paul then tells us about his suffering for the gospel. Paul is 
imprisoned and charged as a criminal, literally as an evildoer. In the book of Acts, the Roman authorities didn't even know what charge to bring against Paul. They didn't know what to write. But here, he has a clear charge against him. And while he may be imprisoned, the word of God is not imprisoned. And because of this fact, Paul continues in verse 10, For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Paul and faithful proclaimers of the gospel may suffer even unto death, so that the chosen may be may obtain salvation in Christ and with it eternal glory. And the results of that work are being with the living and reigning Christ. Continuing on in verse 14, remind them of these things, solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Paul provides yet another command to Timothy. Remind them of these things. Timothy is to remind the faithful, trustworthy men from verse 2 of these things, verses 1 through 13. In addition to that, Timothy is to solemnly charge them in the presence of God. He is to provide stern admonishment that should provoke a healthy fear of the Lord. They were not to engage in a war of words with false teachers, of war of words that would lead only to the ruin of the hearers. The false teachers in and around Ephesus that we addressed in 1 Timothy are still around, are still attacking the truth, and are still attacking the church. Verse 15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Timothy is commanded to be diligent, to make every effort, to be zealous. To what? To present himself approved to God. In the midst of all these worldly circumstances with false teachers and state-sponsored persecution, he's to keep his eyes on God as his primary audience. He needs to be diligent so that when he faces the scrutiny of God, he's not ashamed but he comes out approved as he's accurately handling the word of truth. He's cutting it straight as opposed to the false teachers who want to twist and pervert and mishandle the word. And Paul provides another command in verse 16. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene, Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place. And they upset the faith of some. Timothy is commanded to avoid the worldly talk of these false teachers. Their cancerous content will only lead to ungodliness. Hymenaeus and Philetus used to be men that ascribed to the truth. But now... They've departed from it. They're apostate. They're teaching heresy. And their goal is to draw others away from the faith. This is in the context of Paul's commands and instructions to entrust the treasure of the gospel to faithful men that are able to teach. These apostate false teachers were obviously able to teach and garner a following, and they revealed themselves to be wolves, rejected the Lord and his truth, and they prayed on the church. Timothy cannot see the heart. 
And from a pool of what seem like faithful men that are able to teach, there will be defections. However, the Lord can be trusted. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. The Lord knows who are his people, and his people are to be characterized by holiness, abstaining from wickedness, the very wickedness and ungodly character that's present in these false teachers. Continuing in verse 20. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. After providing an illustration for believers to cleanse themselves from the defiling doctrines and practices of these hypocritical apostate false teachers, Paul commands Timothy to flee from youthful desires and pursue to run after righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Paul then provides a contrast in verse 23, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by by him to do his will. Here Paul provides commands and instructions for Timothy and for those that he would entrust with gospel ministry. There's a lot of activity required to actively pass on this gospel treasure. Receiving the baton of gospel ministry requires us to actively, number one, be guarding the treasure, Number two, passing on the treasure. And next, number three, trusting in the treasure. Paul starts chapter three with something that Timothy needs to know. Starting in verse one. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these, For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Timothy needs to know and to expect that these difficult, perilous, grievous periods of time or seasons will come. Seasons change. They come, they go. And Timothy was living in, and we are living in, the last days. He needed to be prepared for what was ahead of him, and it wasn't pretty. Namely, apostasy. Nominal, professing Christians, particularly leaders, will depart the faith and seek to cause others to do so as well. Timothy is to avoid these men. Continuing in verse 8. Just as Janus and Jomres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus and Jomres' folly was also. 
Janus and Jomris came from Jewish tradition, which Paul would have been very familiar with. And these were the Jewish names that had been given to the Egyptian magicians that opposed Moses back in Exodus. So Paul uses them to illustrate the apostate leaders opposing the truth and rejecting the faith. Next, Paul brings to mind things that Timothy already knows. Verse 10. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of all of them, out of them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Timothy followed Paul's teaching in godly character and was fully aware of the persecutions and sufferings that Paul underwent during his gospel ministry. And here, Paul's continuing to prepare Timothy for persecution from these apostate false teachers, these imposters. The, the difficult seasons, they come and they go, but their trajectory over time gets more intense. And these imposters are only going to get worse over time. Timothy had been timid and lacked courage when Paul was not around. If Timothy went somewhere, there's always the possibility of Paul showing up or receiving a letter from Paul. And one way to say it would be Paul had his back. However, in short order, Paul will never show up again. Timothy will never receive another letter from Paul. And Paul is about to wean Timothy completely off of himself and on to the all-sufficient word of God. Verse 14, You, Timothy, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from who you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy, as a young child, literally as an infant, was no doubt taught the scripture by his grandmother Lois Lois, and his mother Eunice, both devout Jewish Christian women. He wasn't just taught it, he knew it from a very young age. These sacred writings are what we would now call the Old Testament. And here it says that the Old Testament provided wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. When you think of the Old Testament, do you think of the gospel? You should. The good news of a promised Messiah, a promised Christ, was provided in the Old Testament. And the fulfillment of this promised Messiah is what we have in the New Testament. And Paul fortifies Timothy with what he already knows and has known for a very long time. And Paul continues in verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All scripture is literally God-breathed. All of the Old Testament and all of the new divine revelation that's being breathed out by God is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Verse 17, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So that, that's a purpose statement. So that Timothy and particularly those entrusted with the souls of men and more generally every believer may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So that they may be complete and able to meet all the demands of gospel ministry. So that they're ready for service, so that they're fully qualified for every necessary work of ministry. So that shepherds can lead, feed, care, and protect those 
that are in their flock that is the church of God. The breathed out word of God is sufficient for all the work of gospel ministry. Timothy, do you believe that? Do you trust in the sufficiency of the word of God for all the suffering hardships that accompany gospel ministry? Timothy was timid and needed courage to continue in the gospel mission, particularly given that Paul was going off the scene. He needed courage to take the baton and to run with it. And here, Paul tells them that God's word is sufficient for the task. He needs to trust in the sufficiency of the God-breathed treasure that is the word of God. Receiving the baton of gospel ministry requires actively, one, guarding the treasure. Number two, passing on the treasure. Three, trusting in the treasure. And next, number four, heralding the treasure. Given that difficult times are ahead, and given that the god breathed scripture is fully sufficient for the task of gospel ministry, Paul now delivers Timothy his final charge. Starting in chapter 4, verse 1. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Paul brings all the weight that he can possibly bear into this final charge. He charges him in the presence of God and in the presence of Christ Jesus. Right now, Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father in glory reigning. And Timothy is duty-bound in their majestic presence. Timothy believed, as we do, that Christ can return at any moment. And there's almost a sense of urgency that's brought out by calling attention to Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead. And in addition to that, he also charges him by Christ appearing and his kingdom. All of history is hurtling forward in time, to when Christ will be reigning gloriously in his kingdom here on earth. Given the weightiness and solemnity of that charge, Paul commands Timothy to preach. To preach the word. Preach literally means to herald, to proclaim an official message publicly, to make it known. And what is, to be pre- what is to be preached? The word. He is to herald the treasure that is the word of God and all of scripture is God-breathed and available for this task. Further, he is commanded to be ready as a soldier ready to go into battle in a moment's notice or as one that's on watch for an enemy. He is to continue in vigilance. He is to be ready in season and out of season. Seasons come and they go. The underlying thought here with these seasons brings us back to the beginning of chapter 3 when the apostle tells us that difficult times or seasons will come. There will be seasons when it's all hands on deck and there will be seasons of reprieve. Timothy is commanded to always be ready. Paul continues, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with great patience and instruction. Three more commands in quick succession that Timothy is to carry out. He's to carry these out, shepherding God's people. And the phrase, with great patience and instruction, modifies all three of those preceding commands and implies personal interactions. Shepherding is not something that's simply done from up front. Loving, caring, feeding, and protecting God's people takes much time and personal interactions and requires much patience. Paul continues in verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, and they will turn away their ears from the truth 
and will turn aside to myths. Paul provides Timothy with the expectation that faithful gospel ministry may not have lots of conversion, but may have lots of defection. The they here is referring to nominal professing Christians going all the way back to the beginning of chapter 3. And for these make-believers, the time or season will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. They will turn away their ears from the truth and they will turn aside to myths. These nominal professing Christians will depart. They will apostatize. They will defect from the truth and turn to false teaching in accordance with their own lustful desires. Satan is more than happy to provide teachers that fulfill various fleshly desires of sinful humanity. God has saved people out of the world and into the church. Satan wants the church to look like the world. And thus Satan has provided apostate leaders who have apostate churches who are populated by apostate Christians. Paul continues in verse 5, But you, Timothy, be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. In contrast to the difficult expectation that there would be defections, Paul provides Timothy with four more commands. Timothy is to be sober-minded and in control. He's not to be prone to extremes of thought and irrational thinking. He's also to endure suffering and hardship as a part of the work. He's to do the work of an evangelist, a gospel proclaimer, and he's to fulfill his ministry call and obligations. And this is now when we come to Paul's final testimony in verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Paul is imprisoned in Rome and charged as a criminal under Nero's state-sponsored brutal persecution of Christians. And the time period or season of his departure has come. He's expecting to be executed, not imminently, but in a short period of time. Paul has finished the race. He's finished the race of gospel ministry. This whole letter is about passing the baton of gospel ministry to Timothy and to others. And Paul has finished the race triumphantly. Look at verse 8. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. Paul is to receive the crown, the victor's wreath given to athletes who win athletic events. But here, the Lord is the one that's giving it to him as he has faithfully finished the race of gospel ministry. The rest of the letter contains Paul's final gospel ministry direction. Verse 9, Make every effort to come to me soon, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. Even while Paul is in prison awaiting the final sentencing and execution, he is still providing gospel ministry direction. Paul expects Timothy to leave his current assignment in Ephesus and head to Rome quickly. And he's going to be replaced by the beloved and faithful Tychicus, who was well known to the churches in Asia. In verse 16, 
At my first offense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me, the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul will be rescued. But not in an earthly sense. He's not going to be released from prison. This rescue comes from being released from this cursed world and brought safely to his heavenly kingdom and praise God to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And lastly, we come to Paul's final greeting. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Anesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. Make every effort to come to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, also Prudence and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Paul has finished the race of gospel ministry and is passing the baton. And tonight we've discussed how receiving that baton of gospel ministry requires four ongoing activities regarding the treasure that is the word of God, particularly the gospel. Receiving the baton of gospel ministry requires actively, one, guarding the treasure. Number two, passing on the treasure. Number three, trusting in the treasure. And number four, heralding the treasure. I personally feel the solemnity and sobering weightiness of this letter. And I know my fellow elders do as well, as we have the responsibility and the accountability before the Lord for the care of souls here at Grace Bible Church. But what about you? While Timothy, as an apostolic delegate, has a particular role in gospel ministry, and these commands have particular relevance to the church leadership in the work of gospel ministry, all four of these activities are applicable to every faithful believer in the church. If you're here tonight and you're a follower of Christ, you've been on the receiving end of gospel ministry, and you're called to continue to actively participate in it. You're to be actively guarding the treasure, the purity of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. By faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, there's nothing in and of ourselves that we can smuggle into the gospel. We are to be actively guarding that treasure. We're to be actively passing on the treasure, to be discipling others, perhaps making little disciples the old-fashioned way, We're to have older men with younger men, older women with younger women discipling. We're to be actively passing on the treasure. We're to be actively trusting in the treasure that the God breathed scriptures and trusting in their sufficiency for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. We are to actively know and trust the all sufficient treasure that is the Word of God. And we're to be actively heralding the treasure. Proclaiming the gospel message that saves. Reproving, rebuking, and exhorting those in the body as we carry out the one another's amongst the body. We're to go and be actively heralding the treasure both inside the church and outside the church. Last week, when I finished preaching 1 Timothy, I posed the question, How many churches do you know that have been faithfully proclaiming the gospel for over 40 years? I said, if you can think of any, it's probably not that many. And I asked, why is that? Last week, I provided two reasons and said that I would provide a third tonight. Number three, churches have left their first love. In Revelation chapter two, roughly 25 years after Second Timothy was written roughly 40 years after the gospel first came to Ephesus. Jesus sends a letter to the Ephesian church. In that letter, we hear how the Ephesians got the message about false teachers and how they successfully rooted them out. But they left their first love. 
their love for Christ had grown cold and it was no longer demonstrated as it had been in the early years. And we know that that church eventually had its lampstand removed. The Ephesian church disappeared. As we receive the baton and pass on the baton of gospel ministry, we must not forget Jesus. We can get everything else right, but if we leave our first love, we've failed. May this church be faithful to pass on the baton of gospel ministry to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation after that until the Lord comes. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your sovereign care for the church. This is your church. This is your gospel ministry. It's your mission. And we can trust in you to handle feeble instruments, weak instruments, even timid instruments. Lord, that by your power and in your, the grace that you provide, we want to participate in your gospel mission and hand it off to the next generation and the next generation after that. For as long as it takes for you to come, we look forward to that day. In Jesus, it is always in your great name we pray. Amen.